a conversation with a man who has seen it all in leadership. He's been um, an executive vice president of Unilever in Ghana and Nigeria. He's held several leadership uh, positions across the continent of Africa and um, outside of the continent. Today, we have him to share some perspectives with us as we head into election 2024. We're asking the questions. Is our leadership on track to solve the basic challenges that confront us in Ghana today? Mr. Ensako is joining us via Zoom. Grateful for you to join us here. Thanks. Um, it's, being, it's, it's my honor to host you today. Thanks here yeah. again. Thank you. Those were very generous remarks. All I will say is that the person who has seen it all is in the grave. And I'm still alive. So <laughs> there's still a lot to me. I haven't seen it all. <laughs> okay. All right, then. Uh, well, let's start off from leadership, you know, and on, on the structural changes that must happen prior to 2024. Now, in the next few months, about 10 months from now, Ghanaians will be going to the polls to elect a new government. What for you are the structural challenges that should, you know, uh, uh, like help people make decisions on who they will vote for in, in this election? We must start by deriving from first principles. Let's take a snapshot of where we are right now. The biggest problem, in my view, in, in Ghana is that we are, we are caught in endemic poverty. The consequences of endemic poverty are that the majority of our people live in mass misery. If you want to put objective indicators, the census numbers give them to you, but only recently, Old Mutual has published a report where it says 80% of the Ghanaian population earns less than $250 a month. Mm. So in my view, the number one, the central issue that we are faced with is how do we improve livelihoods? Only 5% of our population, according to Old Mutual, earns more than $500 a month. Most of our problems derive from the fact that we have this degree of mass poverty. I prefer to call it mass misery because that, that really is what it is. Mm. And so in order to move forward, we have to focus on what are the big ideas that are going to liberate the productive forces to create prosperity so we can share it and people can access dignity. Because if you do not create prosperity, the idea of shared prosperity does not exist. And democracy is a means, it's not an end. We do not fight for democracy so that we can say, yeah, we are now at the ballot box and we're casting votes and that's it. No, we fought for democracy in order to improve the long-term health of society so that the people of Ghana, not, not just the leaders, the people of Ghana hmm. would be able to say that democracy has delivered a dividend and our society has improved quantitatively and qualitatively. That, for me, is what we are faced with. Now, your question was, what are some of the structural issues? As I talked about the productive forces, I talk about reordering the social relations around the means of production. The big things that you need to do, land reform. You mentioned these people start to quake. What is he talking about? What do you, if you don't, sort out things like that. Land reform. How do you sort out the provision of energy? What is happening around our educational system? Are we producing people who are able to contribute to the country in such a way that we will attain prosperity and can play lead roles in the geopolitical environment that Ghana will find itself in. These are the big issues. But what I see so far is, uh, it's in my view, the discussion has started in a very shallow manner. It's the same incrementalism, the same neoliberal diet that we are having conversations about. And when you want to move from a position of that you are below $3,000 GDP per capita, you want to significantly change that. The conversations cannot be about who is a mate and who is a bookman and who is this. And, and they're entertaining, they make us laugh, they make us joke around. But how are we significantly going to change the things? Mm. We mm. don't have the sufficient infrastructure. What is the conversation about that? And my favorite subject, the political culture itself that has yielded what I call, and you know well, a Santa Claus democracy. People go around, they share money to people. We have just seen 
all sorts of conversations about delegate conferences, some people on the streets sharing yogurt, sharing chocolate. This is what democracy has been, has been reduced to. Somebody even came out and said that I will do well because I have dollars, not CDs. Hmm. Is this what our democracy has been reduced to? This is the Santa Claus democracy I speak about. Well, I show in another context said that some of our African countries have reduced democracy to a public auction for the highest bidder. If you do that, you don't move. So what is the point of view of those who are contesting about these things? And in order that we make it tangible, so that it's not just an abstract conversation, Professor H. Kwesi Prempe, Rosa Kweku Asari, on behalf of the Center for Development and Democracy, CDD, authored a, a report, which in my view, the media has not done a good job of publicizing, which said in a country where... The GDP is less than $75 billion. It takes $100 million for each of the lead candidates in order to be able to prosecute a successful presidential campaign. The starting point, for me, that's the root of all evil. The starting point is where does that money come from? Hmm. And what does each of the presidential candidates think about it? What do they feel must be done to clean up the arena? So that our politics is not so over monetized. These for me are the conversations. And tell me, I ask you the question, what does it matter then in this context if one is a mate, one is a bookman, one is what? What does it matter? Hmm. So, so, so I mean, do, am I right to assume that you therefore don't see that over the years, political leadership has been able to offer solutions to these fundamental challenges and even, you know, the, the sort of solutions that will fix these problems in, in, in its entirety or in their entirety? Well, it's not for me, Alan Sarko, to sit down and give a grade. It is for us all to ask ourselves whether the country is where we believe it should be. Mm. We have been at this now since 1993. So this is our, our 31st year that we are, that we are going into. Of, of the Fourth Republic. I'm not even talking about our existence since since independence or since 1951, when uh, Kwame Nkrumah became head of, of government business. Are we where we want to be? In my view, no. Hmm. The, the indicators, and I don't like to talk about over-financialized indicators, so you look at the, at the society around you and you say to yourself, are you happy? In a situation, 20% of our population, according to census numbers, live in kiosk and containers. Open identification is 18, 18%. We are part of an African continent where the World Bank has only recently said that 1 billion Africans are undernourished. This morning, I was reading a report by some PE firm that they gave to me, 42% of the West African population is all that has access to electricity, 8% in rural areas. These are the stark realities that we cannot run away from. So we, we can tease around and say to ourselves, oh yeah, we've done very well and so on and so forth, that we must face this real. In a few months time, we are going to be flooded because the rains come and again, we will send videos around and we will complain and we will see people drowning and so on. How many years is this going to happen before we, we take action? So I'm not saying that I alone determine how well we have done, but these are the facts. And somebody must interpret the facts. Have there been some benefit? Yes, I prefer what we have to the stark naked brutality of military rule that preceded it, for sure. But we did not say to ourselves that democracy was being fought for so that it would be better, just be a little better than military rule. No, we have bigger ambitions, and that's the way that we must look at it. Mm. Now, from, from the political terrain, do you see the leaders uh, in this current dispensation appreciating these challenges and offering solutions? Do, when you listen to them, do they come across to you as people who are trying to offer the sort of solutions we need to some of these challenges that you are, you are enumerating this, this, uh, today? Well, you, you see, it's not only about the leaders, because we talk a lot about, about 
uh, the leaders, and I, I, I assume when you say leaders, you're talking about the people who are standing for president, vice president, and so that's all our democracy has become about. Okay. There is, for example, a considerable disengagement between the elite and local government in the country. The final mile, as we like to say, last mile of delivery, the capillary of governance is in local government. Mm. If I come into your studio now and I go around and I ask the people who are there, tell me who your district assembly member is and what was the last time that you spoke to him or you attended a district assembly meeting, I suspect that the room will go quiet. And there's a reason why the room goes quiet. The bourgeoisie, the elite, have disengaged from local government. Now, if you do not have a local government that is held accountable, that is competent, you show me the country that has been able to deliver prosperity and development without functioning local government. So we have to start from there and say, why has this disengagement happened? Why has this deterioration in government happened? And then we climb up. And when I get to the leaders, yes, I'll have the, I'm not trying to duck the question, you have the conversation about why are the real issues not on the table? Is our democracy still about people participation? Tell me, do you now, for example, understand, because we talk domestic issues, sitting there, do you understand what is determining the foreign policy of Ghana? I no longer understand. Mm. When I hear that the president uttered this and that, and he's taking this position, and he's reporting Burkina Faso to who, is he speaking on his own behalf, or is he speaking on behalf of the people of Ghana? Where was that debated in parliament? How did we arrive at that? What is my stake in it? What is your stake in it? So the democracy that we are practicing must be returned to the people. We all must lean in, participate. And Matthias said, the Nobel laureate for economics said, democracy is about public reasoning. When people stop engaging, when they are no longer involved in the conversation, you can't call that a democracy. You have an electoral arrangement that is a Santa Claus democracy. And what the Santa Claus democracy yields eventually is an incompetent state because you crack the meritocracy. Mm. And when a meritocracy cracks, what do you end up in? You get into a situation where the country, well, I like to call it, it, it plunges into anomic conditions. And you've heard me say this before. In anomic conditions, you become a Robinson Crusoe society. Because what is driving it is no longer the concern about the ordinary people. Big keys are now driving. You, you, you land into what is prebendalism. And in that situation... Mm -hmm then, you know, you are in real trouble because magical thinking takes over. Magical thinking in the sense of what I call marabou, marabou economics. All that matters is that you make a promise. You jump, you say something. You know, I just saw a headline the other day. One person says, every student in Ghana is going to get laptops. How will you pay for it? How? Where's the money going to come from? When we say 24-hour economy, how are we going to fund a 24-hour economy? What are we going to do to the productive forces to get there? We must get into those details of, of conversation. This is what I call Marabou economics. Everybody says something. Eventually, Marabou economics leads to what uh, Samir Amin called miracles that lead nowhere. Mm. We get huge promises. Then when you say, you told us when you were in opposition or before you came to power, A, B, and C, they say, no, no you're a troublesome guy. Why are you bringing this issue up? So but, it's a but, democracy that turns into a joke. Mm. But, but is, is it also that citizens are also not asking questions enough? And that's why it is the way it is. Well, for citizens to ask questions, they have to be properly informed. So before I get to citizens, I also want to talk about the media. What uh, is the media? Well, 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 we'll get there. I'm, I'm only asking this question because you've said that, you know, people make promises without really providing the source of funding for those promises that's why I'm, I'm asking is it that citizens are also not asking the right questions to be to to make informed decisions before they go into the ballot boxes to, to vote no, yes i i would say that citizens have to get more involved have to ask questions have to lean in but i am not averse to the fact that there is a subtle creeping culture of silence Mm. Uh, when you say that, people say, what do you mean uh, culture of silence it used to be guns and so on and so forth but you talk to people there is a little bit of a worry these days that there, nobody shouts it from rooftops. But our Fourth Republic has suddenly become, if you say something that is even uh, just, just minutely 
different from the way that the powerful forces, and this is true for both parties, by the way. I'm not criticizing one, one or the other. Both mm -hmm. main parties, this, this has been true under them. Then don't don't try to bid for for public procurement deals. Uh, you, you're you're not going to be there. You know you're you're not seen as as uh, as one of them. Yeah. So uh, when when appointments are, are being made, you could be the Nobel laureate for economics. But even when you are looking for an economics economist, if you put in your application, the chances that you will be you will be considered are not there. So. In other dispensations, they have said to each according to his need, to each according to his work. I've said this before in Ghana, it has now become to each mm. Mm. partisan orientation, not even political orientation, to each according to his partisan orientation. You cannot build a country on that basis. So I understand. I don't want to just speak in, uh, to to uh, to ask people to speak up to join a conversation means that we must create an environment that is conducive for public reasoning. Okay. To do that, you need to have deeper engagement between leadership and the broad masses. They must be interested in in connecting with the masses in sincere terms, listening to them, showing the same people who are afraid. To, to speak out on some issues, they talk when it comes to other matters of social engagement. They go to the debates, they speak out. So it's not a genetic disorder. So we must talk about this. Mm. And we must ensure that we are better informed and we can all participate in the conversation. Okay. Now, we are still speaking uh, to Mr. Yaon Sako. He is former executive vice president of Unilever, Ghana and Nigeria. We're talking about a varied array of issues from leadership to what is facing our economy and what needs to be done as we prepare for another uh, election in 2024. Now, let's get to leadership. You, you enumerate... Uh, you really set the tone on what is the most challenging things that confront the economy of Ghana, I mean, the socio-economy of Ghana. Um, what are the most critical leadership qualities that are needed to fix the challenges that confront the socio-economy of, of, of this country? I'll give you an answer that is borrowed largely from, from three people. The helping of, of China. Uh, actually four, uh, but two of them wrote a book. And then from Larry Bus. All right, so we are having an exclusive chat, uh, exclusive conversation with uh, Mr. Yao Nsako, uh, former executive vice president of Unilever Ghana and Nigeria. Yes, so uh, the, the line's okay now. You are making a point when the line tripped. Okay. I'm not totally. I said I was going to give you an answer from from three sources. Yeah. One is the redoubtable Deng Xiaoping of China, uh, Professor Peter Senge, and then from Larry Bosidi and Ram Charan. They wrote the book Execution, so uh, their views are collective. That's why I said three, but it's actually four people. And it's my own interpretation, so I'm not necessarily using their words, although mm. I will use some of those. So one, the leadership, the leader's role, the central role is that you have to formulate, give the leadership that constructs the strategic vision. It doesn't mean you do it alone, you do it with a team, but you have to, to make that process work. I consider the most important role of leadership then to be that you establish a meritocracy that enables you to pick a competent team. The other leaders that you're going to work with at other levels. For me, that is the leader's central role. And it is possible, actually, to just look at the quality of a cabinet and immediately say, ah, this guy is finished. Ah, because you look in there and you can see already that it's not going to be delivered. So picking the other leaders is, is critically important and it must be done on a meritocratic basis. There's too much partisanship that has gone into, into this process so that you don't necessarily end up with people with the best capabilities. Now, when the strategic vision has been done and you've picked the other leaders, the leader's role is to conduct the operations mm. and make sure that those strategic plans 
are executed. Conduct the operations. The idea of an aloof big man who is walking in the heavens and doesn't know what is happening, you cannot deliver stuff like that. Hmm. Conducting the operations means that you're also connected to the masses. You know exactly what is going on. People cannot just lie to you. They come and show you all sorts of figures, but it has absolutely no impact. So I will summarize these three things. Strategic vision, picking the other leaders, conducting the operations to get execution going. And if you do that with properly connected to the masses, what it must lead to is that you arouse, you explode, you detonate the initiative of the masses so that you build a certain degree of engagement through democracy. Mm -hmm. And they come up with creativity, passion. They are pushing themselves because they see where you want to go. They know that you are fighting for the country to make all of them better off. And they are switched on. Mm. That's, 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 that's how. I mean, in, in China, Deng Xiaoping said after three years, he said the ideas that came from rural, rural China surprised all of us in leadership. Are we that switched on? Have we been inspired? Have we been triggered? Have, have our initiative, collective initiative, has our collective initiative been triggered and exploded in that kind of way? It is for us to decide. Mm. Mm. Very interesting, uh, thought-provoking issues uh, uh, today here. Now, um, in your opinion, uh, what role do youth and women uh, play in shaping the future leadership of, of, of this country, Ghana? I'll give you the simple answer that I don't see why it must be any different. They are citizens of democracy like men. Uh, they, they, they participate. So I think what is important is that our democracy must be constructed so that whether you are man, woman, child, not even child, youth, because you didn't say child, youth, you feel that it embraces you. Some of the people that we call youth uh, are 40. Macron was 37 or whatever when, it, when he became president of, of, of France, a, a major country uh, with a developed economy. So, and yet we sometimes just dismiss them as youth and they are the back seat. So our job is to create a, a climate and a kind of democracy that is meritocratic. If that happens, the youth and women will determine for themselves what the agenda is. It's not for me, a man, to sit here and, 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 lecture, and lecture them about what they should do. Mm. They maybe even have views about what men should do better. So mm. that's the way that I look at it. Okay. Mm. Now, you speak about, you know, how other people carried the people along in, in trying to build a sort of nations that we've seen in other countries. In Ghana, what we've seen is that leadership sometimes try to do certain things, but they miss some, some things that do not augur well for what they want to achieve. How can leaders balance short-term policy priorities with what we want to achieve long-term in terms of our development goals? All right, um, we're still, uh, um, the, the line through the bed, Mr. Nsako, so if you, can, if you can start all over again for me. Okay, mm. what, you, what you're asking me to comment on, mm. if I got you right because it was a small break, is how to balance the long term with the short term. Exactly. I'm going to do that right. Okay, sure. So what we have spoken about before, mm. connection to the masses. Mm -hmm. The people themselves are the center of the conversation, local government, national government, they are the center, the welfare of the people, not, not a, a few powerful, usually powerful people, usually a few powerful men sitting somewhere constructing an agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, you go back to what uh, J.M. Karuki famously said in Kenya, we do not want a country, a society that, that produces 10 millionaires and 10 million to create an environment in which the people themselves are participating in the conversation. If they are participating in the conversation, then what is going to happen is that you are focused on the big ideas. So your strategy is built around that. How do you secure the long-term health of society, improve people's livelihoods, ensure that there is shared prosperity and shared dignity? Your strategic direction then becomes very clear because you know what you're trying to achieve. Tactics will change. 
Tactics change because today inflation is up, tomorrow inflation is down. There's a flood somewhere where you didn't expect. Those are tactical changes. But because you are so focused on the big idea and the nature of your leadership is one of public reasoning, it's engaging, it's participative, what happens is when you become disengaged, the conversation is no longer happening, then the least thing that happens, you completely swerve away from what is the big thing that you're trying to deliver. And nothing gets nothing gets done. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Now, uh, I mean, this is a country that has always said that, oh, we started off with countries like Malaysia, with Singapore, and we've seen how these countries have, have shaped up and have developed to a place that now we even have to go to them to, uh, for some support here and there. I mean, what lessons can Ghana learn from successful leadership models in Africa and other places like what Lee Kuan Yew did in Singapore and what you know, other leaders did for Malaysia and where? What kind of successful lessons can leadership learn from, from these, these successful ones? I think we've spoken about some of what I've said already, there are things that these countries did. But mm. the starting point is a mindset and an insight into your condition. Do we accept we are saddled with mass misery? You go to the starting points of Singapore, Malaysia, China, etc. That was the first acceptance mm. that we have underperformed our potential. There was a Mindset orientation in, in, in China, uh, Deng Xiaoping called it enhanced mindsets. First, you build a revolutionary consciousness that you are not where you're supposed to be and you can do better. I don't know. You talk like I'm, I'm talking, they say, oh, you, you only point out negative things. I say, but, but why must we deal, uh, ignore the structural and then we say to ourselves that we, we are patting ourselves on the back. So the examples are clear. The things that people, other people did were not magical. They first of all understood your cultural environment, your sociocultural environment. They, it, there was an ignition of the mindsets of the masses. They got solidarity on that basis. And because they were deeply connected to what was happening with the masses, they understood the real nature of their problems, and they solved them. Nobody's going to jump from the sky. There's no leader that is going to drop from the sky and just comes down and suddenly has a magic wand and the problem. We are going to have to do that. And I don't believe, really, that our, our problems are just a lack of understanding. Yes, I, I have my worry about the, the neoliberal road on which we have become so addicted and we are so focused to. Mm. But if we just implement some of the things that we say. I'll give you one example. The Land Act says that it has now outlawed the existence of land guards. Mm -hmm. uh, you smile. I know how the land guards disappeared. Mm -hmm. And what is the consequence of non-disappearance? Mm -hmm. What has not been said, both during the NDC and and the president even put his presidency on the stake to solve Galamse. Yeah, every day we wake up and our politics is going on and we're going into another election. The main candidates are not even talking about it. That we said, our law said that we have outlawed land guards. Why are the land guards still there? Because you have not dealt with the structural problems that produces them. You cannot solve a fundamental and structural problem simply by an administrative fiat. You have to deal with the issues. If you've not reformed land properly, how are you going to get peace? The reason why these, we call them land guards, but they are private armies. They are a reflection, a consequence of the inefficiency and the ineffectiveness of land, of land administration in Ghana. Mm. If you don't deal with it, how are you going to ever be able to convince people that they shouldn't have land guards? Because you write a law, I know the conversation, people talk a lot, we need a new constitution. Yes, I too feel that some amendments must be done, but will the constitution enforce itself? Recently, I was reading a book on local government in Ghana, and I saw a law that says that if you have stray animals in walking around residential mm -hmm. areas and so on and mm -hmm. so forth, local government machinery 
has actually the power and the authority in law yep. to confiscate them, auction them, mm -hmm. and pay to the public church. You tell me the last time that happened. <laughs> I can only give you, I can only give you examples of some assemblies in the Western region, but that's all. That's all I know. A long time. So, so, so I say to the people who say that the new constitution will solve all our problems, that will the constitution implement itself? Will it implement itself? My my good friend Isan Kuma likes to ask that question. He says, if we are not able to implement the laws that are on the table right now, you get a new constitution. Will it implement itself? Mm. So, yes, I do think some changes must be made, but that we cannot be that simplistic. We have to deal with the structural impediments to development. And to be able to do that, you said we will come to the media. I will remind you that we, we have to talk about the media. To do that, mm. we need to get a completely different kind of mindset or orientation as citizens, as leaders. How do we orchestrate that mindset revolution in order to be able to have these sorts of conversations and change the locus and focus of our democracy? Move it away from this neoliberalism that is a miracle that has led no one anywhere ever in the world. Mm. And completely look at how we build homegrown indigenous, indigenous solutions. Because we understand the context we are playing, we learn from other people, but we know what to do in our specific circumstances, and we build a democracy that holds people accountable. Mm. So, so let, me, let me put it back to you. How and when and who should lead this, this, this process of trying to get us to understand that, well, we have failed, and we need to start all over again and start on this note? It's for all of us. I always laugh when I'm asked the question, who? The citizens of Ghana, of which you and I are, are part. All of us must play a role. Mm. The roles that we choose to play may be different. It's not everybody who should want to be president or go to local government. Some people want to play football for black stars. Some people want to sing in the choir. Those are all roles in a civilization. But we all are accountable for where Ghana is. We have to accept that. And then from there, we say, let's participate in the conversation and approach it from a completely different... The main thing, Chino Achebe used to say, civilization does not fall from the sky. Mm. Mm. We are not one day going to wake up after some big all night or something of the sort, and then boom, Ghana has transformed. And it's a developed country with a GDP per capita of $70,000. We are going to have to do the hard work. So mm. are we willing to do the hard work? Are we willing to have the tough conversations? I know that these sort of conversations make people uncomfortable. When you say that we are still running a colonial education system, we, we must have conversations about what is the role of religious bodies. Are they enhancing productivity? Ask questions about the media. Ask questions about the Santa Claus democracy. Ask questions about the institution of chieftaincy. But when you talk about these things, you say, no, 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 no. Uh, let's talk about how we will get uh, inflation down by 10 basis points. Then, then we will never see prosperity in our lifetime. Hmm. Well, let's talk about your, your favorite uh, issue then, um, the media and civil society. How can these two, the media and civil society, help in holding governments accountable? Well, they work hand in hand. That, that, is, that is for sure. The, the two work hand in hand, and I... The reason I've been talking about the media, only yesterday with some friends of mine, we were having a, a chat about this, which I thought was a very high quality conversation. You see that there's always uh, a pattern in what I say, that I like to go to root causes. Because you can hit people for symptoms, but you have to go to what is causing the issue fundamentally. And if mm -hmm. you deal with the root causes, the likelihood is that you then sort out the problem. So the media and civil society, I like put it all together. Mm. But the media in Ghana faces one issue. I was quite involved in, uh, if you ask Reku Brobe, you see that he generously put my name uh, in his book when he wrote about Radio I and so on. The situation that led to the private electronic media emerging, because Jerry Rawlings had seen the private press and panicked. And then the intrepid Reku Brobe, emerged with, with Radio I, forced the hand of the Gestapo at the time, 
because it had now demonstrated to the people of Ghana, mm. we need to really cement Reku Brobi's place in Ghanaian history. Uh, because we forget about him too, too quickly. He took a major risk. And guess who was his lawyer? The current the president. president. Yes. And my good old comrade, the late Akuto Ampa, were the people in that dangerous environment. In fact, the person who, when there was a raid on Radio I, the first person to get there was Nana Akufuad. Mm. He a president. So he understands the issues I'm going to talk about even more than, than I do. Some of them, I learned them from him. So I'm challenging him to say those things that he used to talk about, it's been seven years. Why has he not implemented them? Yesterday, I asked the question, how many radio stations do we have in Ghana now? I was giving a figure of 700. Oh, back. I don't know whether that is the right one. How, in a country as poor as Ghana, are you going to have 700 viable radio stations? So you ended up with this very fragmented landscape, hyper-fragmentation. Most of them are not as viable. How many of them can employ you? Mm. I will not embarrass by extracting the, question, the answer from you, mm. but you know the answer. How many of them can employ you? Mm. So you will now have media stations. They are unable to invest in their own development, the development of talent, the development of programming, and what you see is an endemic, endemic presence of mediocrity everywhere. They exist only to the extent that sometimes they play music or something. They cannot attract good people. When when you guys started, Joy, when you first when you first started, the kinds of people you turn on to those days, front page, Kwekuche Chiado, it was people like uh, Sami Okujeto, Kofi Awuno, J.H. Mensah, Doa Jaho, you know, these were people who were reflective. They had high capabilities in the society. They didn't always agree. But when you listen, the current president himself was a regular on, on, on your own. And you listened to them and you felt when Tony Edu, you felt when you finished listening to them that you had really developed in terms of the sort of information. I don't want to put people down and mention some of the names of the people that are here now. This is now a serial call, I say, screaming banshees. Hmm. So now when you ask people to come and participate in talk program, people say, I don't want to get involved in these sort of serial color thing. Everybody's just shouting about what they do not know. So the first thing that you need to do is to trigger and incentivize some sort of, of consolidation in the industry. One way to do that is that we have to take away the restrictions that say that if you have a certain frequency, technologically, it is possible for those frequencies to go national. The reason I spoke about Jerry Rollins panicking was that that was a control mechanism of the Gestapo. They were trying not to have an institutional rival to the state-owned media at the time. So they put this rule there and fragmented the media. But Jerry Rollins has been gone since 2000. Mm. Why did Jay Paul not restructure? Why did Mills not restructure? Why did Mahama not restructure? Why has Akufuado, who was the lawyer who argued these things, who taught us many of the things that I'm talking about now, in seven years, why has he not done it? Hmm. And when you do that, you will start to get consolidation happening. Then you have deep institutions. You still want to keep the diversity. You don't want all of them to be saying the same thing or have the same ideological orientations or, or what have you. So you, you now create stations that have the depth to have talent. They can invest in innovation. They can spend time, produce high quality programming and so on. And because of those standards, you start to again attract talent back into, into the radio stations. Okay. So we want to deal with this matter. Unless you also have a vibrant media, the civil society weakens. And what you are now seeing, if you guys are not careful, there is going to be an obsolescence of traditional media because mm. people are now using the channel of social media more. Mm. At the time that Jerry Rollins put these restrictions in place, he and his Gestapo at, at the time put these restrictions in place, social media was nowhere near where it is right now. Yeah. But today, yeah. if the media does not reinvent itself, it will find that it becomes obsolete. It becomes a shriveled appendage of a political system that is irrelevant. And already there are some radio stations you mentioned and everybody say, oh yeah, they're just a megaphone of, of some politician or the other. Mm.
So this is a fundamental issue. I'd like to hear the presidential candidates make commitments on this. What will they do about this? You look at it through the things that they have published, they don't even talk about it. And you guys too, where is the media commission? At one point in time in our democracy, when Carol Blair me here and, and uh, Gifty Afeni Dazi were leading the Ghana Journalists Association, mm -hmm. that was one of the most vibrant body. Where is their voice on this? Why are they quiet? Why are they not speaking? The Ghana Bar Association, we are talking about laws here. Why are they not speaking about it? These are the real issues in our democracy. And these are the issues that we must force the presidential candidates to make commitments. I must take advantage now to say the presidential candidates must tell us now, now, do they believe in the electoral system that they are going to use, yes or no? Because it has now also become a fashion that after every election, yes, it is better than going to the bush, I agree, but the country is significantly distracted from its development agenda because everybody runs to the courts. Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm. no, we don't trust the EC. If you don't trust the EC, you do not register to be a candidate. Okay. You tell us what you know so that we have the conversation now. Don't wait till after the election and say, no, we never had any confidence in it. So that is also one thing. The media must push the people. Will you accept the result? Do you have confidence in the electoral system that you have signed up to be a part of? Yes or no? But we don't have these conversations. Then we lose, on one occasion, seven months. We were litigating in the courts. Seven. You lose seven months on a thing like this. Where does development focus? So the Santa Claus democracy loses credibility. Many people are now having conversations, to my surprise. There are some people who even were, were welcoming the coups that were happening in West Africa. Say, How can you now depend on coups to drive development? If that was the solution, we've had several of them. Why are we not developed? Mm, mm, mm. Interesting. Um, well, from you are passionate about Ghana and its development. Just uh, yesterday, uh, the president announced a reshuffle. Uh, you know, or, or let me say, just within within a uh, couple of uh, days ago, the president announced a reshuffle, uh, jostling some members of his government. What What do you think about this uh, new reshuffle that the president has done? Look, I always look at things in terms of talent decisions from the mm. point of view of the art. So I know that, again, we become very excited and having all sorts of conversation. When we're watching football, the AFCON has just ended. When the coach makes changes, what do you look for? Do you celebrate because a change has been made? No, you want to see it change the, the, the scores. And as a, a, a good friend of mine, a South African guy, once, once said to me, the scoreboard has no space for commentary. Uh, you just look up there and the scores are there. Two, one, three, two. There is no, no narrative over there. Hmm. So the changes have been made. I do not wish to comment on the changes that have been made. What no, no, no I, mean, I mean, you, you, you seem to have a certain vision. That there's something you want to see happen in Ghana. Do yes. these people who have been brought in you know, do you have trust or, or do you see them making any meaningful impact in the next 10 months that, that they are left with? We'll, we'll assess by the outcome. That's where I was going. That's what we have to have the conversation about. But just for people to come and say to me that this person went to Harvard, that person went to Cambridge, this person went to Yale is irrelevant mm. to me. Mm. Totally irrelevant. Yeah, I want to see if you say that this is a better team, then they must have better outcomes. That's all. And, and I, I will suggest that that is what also the media focuses on. There's a new finance minister. What is he going to do differently? Can he tell us? And what he says he's going to do differently, is it going to lead to better outcomes? Can we all, after the Akufado now has less than a year to go, but can we all say that, wow, he did a reshuffle and we completely saw a difference? We are looking for super subs. Roger Mela. I don't know whether you were old enough to watch Roger Miller when he was playing at Jacksonville University. We I read about it. When, hmm. Yes, when they would, when Roger Miller would trot, trot onto the whole African continent, would go crazy because he knew what was going to happen. He was a super sub. So are these super subs, or this is just some sort of footnote and so on? So I don't want to get fixated about it. Miller was a super sub because he affected the outcome of the games. Are these super subs or are these also also runs? You know, there are some people, the coach brings them on because the game is now 
89 and a half minutes and they have 30 seconds to finish the game. But they want them to say that they also participated in this tournament, so they bring them on. So it is for the people who have been appointed to show us whether they've been brought on so that they can also get certificates of participation. Or when they came in, mm. they made a difference. And we will all see. Mm. But aren't there things they could do to probably turn around things in these days that, that we're left with? There, there certainly are things, and we've started to talk about some of them. Of course, you know, we are not going to get all the structural changes in 10 months. Mm. But you have to start to order things in a way that you build a foundation so people can take over. And most of today, or, or this session, that's what we've been talking about. I don't want to, to rehash all, all of that. But mm -hmm. if they're just going to do the things that the other people were doing well, then, then what is even the purpose of, of this? So there are, there are other things. One of which should be more engagement. It's given me the opportunity to say something that I wanted to talk about. Yeah? We've become so partisan and so functional that one of my big regrets... I asked a question recently to some people. I said, Kwame Pianim spoke at the UPSA event. Has he been invited by cabinet and the president? When I knew this to these people, they used to be friends. So what has happened that the president is not able anymore? I've called publicly on 25th July 2023. I said, invite some of your old people because they will come and they will tell you the truth. Not the people who are sitting around you and telling you that there's no problem. It's ratings agencies who are doing this. What have ratings agencies done to us? And somebody says to me, no, Kwame Pianim is a, is a bad noir. Um, he, he's not called to, to these things. And now I have a long list of people who I knew personally to be Akufado's friends. Who I, when I meet them, I say, are you talking to your friend? They say, oh, no, no, we don't see him again. If you're that cloistered, well, and that becomes our political culture. It is not participative. Somebody comes out of his way and he says, I think we should look at things. No, he's, he's, he's branded as an enemy of the system. And all that we do, I'm sure as I'm speaking, all that people are thinking about it, where does this guy actually stand? What I'm saying is not important to them. They want to know whether it's, it's MPP or NDC. That's all that matters in Ghana. You cannot build a country like that. You simply cannot. So we must again create the environment where we have leaders who understand that the person who criticizes you is actually taking a risk. They, they most likely are doing that because they want to see a different outcome. So you must welcome them into the arena. Mm. You know, he, he must get to the kind of place where somebody goes out there very critical. Like, uh, okay. Pianim was not even very, was not even very critical. He, okay. he made his point. You call him. Mm. Tell me what you have to say. Let's have an engagement about it. You are not bound to do it, but you take what you want from it. Mm. Mm. Okay, let's see how this will go. But let me take you to one very important issue as well in the last uh, couple of months. Um, in, last year, we know that uh, the uh, voter base in the lower voter basin got flooded. Uh, several hundreds of people were affected. Now, several months down the line, we have not heard anything, nothing has happened. I mean, I'm sure by now, uh, you know, somebody should have been held responsible. What should have happened by now? Who should bear the, 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 you know, the responsibility or the blame of what happened? Well, the starting point is that we, we are caught in the realm of speculation. That we, an interministerial committee was formed. Uh, have they issued a report? Uh, has there been a commission of inquiry? Mm. VRA, which is the public sector body that is at the center of this, have we got a, a report? I actually have gone out cold looking for it and I can't find one. So the starting point is that the facts of what went wrong must be put before us. What are the lessons from this? This is how you develop a democracy. That's what Amatya said meant by public reason. Where are the facts? Can they be put before us? Has there been a parliamentary committee? What did parliament discuss? But this is, a, well, you know, when I was hitting at the media, there was an interministerial committee. You guys knocked, the, you, you jumped about it to high heaven, then what? What is the outcome of the interministerial committee? Do we know what we are going to deliver? So I don't want to speculate because I don't have all the facts. But what I checked, 36,000 people of our compatriots were displaced. Some of them have not been able to go back into their homes. 
and life just continues. The politicians, many of them, they rushed there. Photo ops, the president was there, the opposition leader was there, they took pictures, they made some donations, and then they moved on. I said this somewhere, somebody said, but you have to give credit at least to the MP, he has built 600 houses. Okay, fine, he has built, I, I, I consider, what about the other people who rushed there? with big trucks, food, etc. Have they asked the question, what has happened to the people? Mm. So it's not a simple, this is a, this is symptomatic of a democracy, Santa Claus democracy that is not accountable. And then it takes me to the point that I make and then people say, you, you, you want to just uh, inflame passions. I say, no, it's not, it's not inflaming passions. 36,000 people. If 36,000 people in upper class Accra were displaced. Mm. Their friends are people in Joy FM and, 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 and your players. They went to all the prestigious schools. They, they are, would we be this quiet and this indifferent? Mm. 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 If, 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 if cantonments, rich, East Airport, uh, well, airport residential, you, you know the, the, the places now, Better than, better than me. Trasaco Valley. What's it? If those places, if they lay in the pathways of, of, of the spillage, would we just have pumped water and displaced that 6,000 of the bourgeoisie? Mm. And would this country be as peaceful as it is? Okay. I don't want mm. to answer the question. I leave it for everybody to think about. And therefore, it is an indictment on us, the elite. I count myself as part. It is an indictment on us that when things affect the ordinary people, we are a little bit more indifferent. And if you build a society like this, it's something I say all the time. Okay. James Baldwin famously said, the most dangerous creation of any society is the man with nothing to lose. That is what we are doing. Mm, mm. But, but shouldn't government be ashamed of itself that months after this happened government has not sent any relief i mean the 200 million dollars uh, million cities that was devoted we don't know where it is the committee as you say have not brought out any report it's only the, the mp and some of his partners who have done something shouldn't government be ashamed that i mean month after this nothing really is coming in from government to the people no i don't want to dock the responsibility of government in it yes it's a very clear accountability for mm. government yeah, but sometimes we also hide behind government should do this and government should do that. What has the media done? Has this been on the air every day? What have, what have the religious bodies done? What, what has parliament done? What, what has the opposition done? What have the community leaders done? All of us, and especially, I like to talk about the elite, because we have benefited from an education on the basis of the the back-breaking exertion of ordinary people, workers okay. and peasants. And if our elevated status in society just leads us to be indifferent to this, then we have failed more than how many people since this happened wake up every morning and are asking their MPs, what are you doing for these guys? Are calling the ministers, what are you doing? Are calling VRA. That is a society where you really have solidarity. 36,000 people their homes were flooded. Some of them have lost their livelihoods forever. They've not been able to return. And we just take it as, oh, it's fine. We're happy. We, we had Valentine's Day yesterday. We're enjoying mm -hmm. ourselves. We're sending ribbons up and down, and we're, we're very happy. So one day, when the people get angry and they rise up, they put all of us in it. And they mm. say, you were not there when we were suffering. Okay. All right. Mr. Yansako, I'm grateful to you for uh, spending this time with us this afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I wish you the very best going forward and let us all pray mm. and work hard that in the days ahead, we will see a better Ghana. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now, Mr. Yaon Sako is a former executive vice president of Unilever Ghana and Nigeria. Um, he shared a lot of thoughts on the leadership and what we could do to transform the economy, the social economy of Ghana. Well... The, con the discussion should continue wherever you are. Thanks for being a part of us. This has been John News. My name is Samuel Kojo Brace, and it's been an honor to be with you today.